Hey everyone, it's Ride 1940 here. Today we're taking a look at Sea Power Naval Combat in the Missile Age. This can be a very direct tutorial on using your ASW helicopters. We're going to teach you how to find a submarine with the helicopters and what to do with the helicopters to kill the submarine. So the first thing we often think about when we're doing an ASW scenario, and also if you're brand new to the game, you're going to think to yourself, how the heck do I know where a submarine is in all this space? Like, where, where would I even put the helicopter? Oh, uh, that is a valid question, and it kind of depends. So... In this particular scenario, we have a passage that we've been tasked to transit through. So if, if I was you, I'd probably want to put some sauna buoys along this route just to kind of listen in and it kind of be an insurance policy to us. If a torpedo was fired at range, we would detect it hopefully early and allow our ships to maneuver away from it. Um, and you're playing different scenarios where you're just tasked to search a, a body of water for a particular submarine. Then uh, we'll do a method that I'm going to demonstrate here. And now I was a former sonar supervisor on an Oliver Hazard Perry class uh, frigate and an Arleigh Burke class destroyer. And I'm not going to teach you the real tactics, but this is kind of what I think is appropriate to play the game and get you started. So the fundamental way that we're going to search for a submarine is using our ship-based sensors, okay? We, the reason we do that is because if you could imagine the power generation that a ship can produce to power these sensors is orders of magnitude larger than what a battery pack and a sauna buoy is going to be able to do, right? So because of that, we want to use our sensors that are on the ship to find the sub. And then once we found it, we want to use our helicopter to get uh, vectored out over it at range and drop a torpedo on it. So that way we stay safe as on, on the ship. Uh, we can see here we got the towed array out on this destroyer and uh, we've got an active hull mounted sonar, but we're not going to use the active, okay? Because that's going to broadcast our position and I'm not interested in doing that right now. Uh, so, this is our towed array, the SQR-18. It is the predecessor to the SQR-19, which is what I was a technician on. Um, and this is the Nixie. So, we are just cruising along, and uh, I'll show you. This is pretty valid, okay? Uh, one of the things you can do is, if you're brand new and you're still kind of learning about the ASW stuff, is I recommend pulling out 10.3 nautical miles. And the reason we want to do that is, uh, well, 10.4, that's fine. Uh, that is the range of a 5365, which is a really prolific um, Soviet torpedo. It's a wakecombing torpedo. It's on, a lot of, it's on a lot of submarines. Okay, so there we go. We've got detection on the uh, contact here with our tow array. Simply, simply detected on our tow array. That's all we did. We just cruised along at like six knots. And as I was saying, we've got this bubble tagged onto the lead ship of the formation, so that way we know when we get contact. Am I safe from an immediate uh, fire? Uh, or am, I, am I safe from an immediate torpedo attack, right? Uh, do I need to counter fire immediately? Um, so we're not in that bubble. And that's not to say that there aren't torpedoes that can go further than this. There certainly are. But this is one of the most prolific ones, so I, I tend to watch that the most. Okay. Uh, as you know more about the contact, then you can kind of look at the unit reference and look at the torpedoes it's capable of firing. And then you can kind of see what the real danger area would be. Now. Uh, we've detected this at 15 nautical miles. It's important in this game because the environmental factors always change on the scenarios uh, that you kind of make a mental note of when you're detecting these things and what they're doing when you detect them. So if I click on him, I can see his speed's at 13 knots. So I can guess if he's going around that speed, I can expect on my tow array to detect a submarine of, of this guy at 15 nautical miles. Um, now that we have a contact though, I'm not going to waste any time trying to develop the contact further. I just know that there's a submarine out there. So I'm going to right click on the ship for the flight deck and oops, what's going on here? Sometimes this gets in a weird state. And then we'll go make sure we have the ASW loadout and then we'll launch. Okay. So for the US side, there's uh, two particular helicopters out. Can we see that it's hostile now? Pardon the jets flying over if you hear that in the background. I live next to a very active military base. Okay, so this is the SH-2. There's a couple of helicopters that we're interested in. Uh, the SH-3 will go over also. SH-2s have uh, a surface sonar or a surface search radar, and so they can look out 75 nautical miles and help build the surface picture. And we still want to have that on for ASW because we want to detect if the submarine broaches or if there's a submarine that might have to come to the surface to fire its missiles. Uh, and hopefully try to pick up any mast or anything like that if it snorkels or comes to periscope depth to take a peek. So always use that. And it's got two Mark 46 lightweight torpedoes. They are the same Mark 46s that come out of the Mark 32 um, over the side torpedo launchers on these ships. 
And um, I th I'm hoping in the future, when you rearm the uh, torpedoes on these helicopters, that they pull from the stock because they are the exact they are the torpedoes that would be pulled from the torp mag and uh, banded and put on these helicopters. Those same torpedoes, you could put them on the Mark 32 launcher and fire them. So this guy's going to get spooled up, and we're going to we'll see when they first launch. They kind of go off to the side and circle, and then you'll have to tell them what to do. So once he's doing that, we'll give him a waypoint to come out in front of this guy. And uh, yeah, so if we're looking at the helicopter for the SH-2, um, you can see here he's got 11 SSQ-53s. Those are the die-far sauna buoys, and those are the passive sauna buoys. So that's important because they do a very different thing than the SSQ-62, which is the die cast, and that is an active sauna buoy. Now you can see he's doing his uh, waypoint there, so we're going to tell him to come out this way. So we lost contact there. You kind of see it's faded off. Uh, we're going to keep going this direction, though. And the difference between the active and passive sauna buoy, uh, and, and just in general with active and passive, is active sonar is going to give you pretty rapidly the range and bearing, and then if you get marks on it, you'll be able to tell course and speed pretty quickly. Okay, you can get course and speed with passive sonar, but it's going to take some time to develop that information because uh, you need to see certain things happen. And uh, the downside to active is, uh, well, you know, if people say, well, if we can always get course and speed that way, why don't we just use that all the time? Uh, the, the problem is you cannot classify a contact really with active sonar. If you can imagine uh, a ping going out there and, and hitting something, that's all that ping's doing. It's not telling you what it is. You just know that you hit something. So the passive sonar is what's going to tell us what that thing is. And that's important in the game because uh, while in real life there are a lot of things that you can get an active return off of, uh, in, in the game world, what we're most concerned with is uh, friendly submarines in the scenario that uh, we might not know about. Okay, uh, And um, well, I take that back. In the game, we've got friendly submarines, but you're often in control of them. But if, if somebody had made it so that there's like a neutral party, uh, you'd, you'd be worried about hitting them. Um, so if you wanted to play really kind of like willy-nilly, un unrealistically, certainly go ahead and kill all these <laughs> contacts you find. But if you want to play with some uh, more realism, make it a little bit more believable, we want to drop uh, passive sauna boost first. And the benefit of that also is that they don't know that they're being detected. Okay passive sauna buoy just sits there and simply listens. Okay, so that is uh, enough about the SH-2. While they fly out, we'll talk about the SH-3, and we'll also have the SH-3 come a little closer here. Okay. This guy is way too high. We can right-click down here, or left-click, sorry. There we go. And then we can tell him to go to a different altitude. I'm going to bring him down to 20 feet so we can show off some of the other things that you can use with these helicopters. Now, the SH-3 doesn't have a radar, but it does have a dipping sonar. So, this is an active uh, dipper that is going to tell us uh, range of bearing to the submarine and the course and speed and stuff like that. But like I said earlier, we're not going to be able to tell what it is unless we drop passive sauna buoys. It's got a few fewer SSQ-53, so it's got three fewer, uh, but it has the same number of active buoys. And uh, like I said, the main difference there is instead of having the surface search radar, we've got um, an active dipper. Now you can dip to your heart's content, you're just kind of limited by fuel. Um, the downside is, like I said, you're not going to be able to, once you identify a contact, you're not going to know what it is, you'll just know that you have a contact. Okay. Uh, the other thing that both the helicopters have is this guy right here. Oh, that's really neat there, it's just flying out together. This is a matter ray, and then if we look at the uh, SH-3, SH-2, sorry, this is theirs, just a little bit more colorful. Now, if we want to use it, all we have to do is tell them to go to an ordered height of 20 feet, and it's going to start streaming out as it gets to a lower altitude. As long as they're moving forward and at the 20-foot ordered height, you'll see that going, and you'll get um, the contact will say, uh, like, I think a magnetic anomaly, and it'll tell you what the size of that is. It's kind of brief. You basically almost have to go right over it to detect something. Uh, so you don't want to really use it as a searching tool because the, the area that it can see is pretty limited. You most likely are going to use this as a confirmation that there is something there. Um, and in real life, there's just so many things that can be out there. So it's as if you can get more sensors looking at something to correlate something, then you can feel confident that you have uh, something of value versus like a C-mount, right? <laughs> 
Uh, when I was a sonar supervisor, that was my biggest fear, is to track a C-mount. So I did a lot of things to make sure I wasn't doing that. So that's the last thing you want. Oh, that's really cool. See, you got both of them streaming their mad arrays. Okay. Now, let's talk about the, the next thing we have to do is we've got helicopters coming out. Uh, we want to place a buoy, right? So we're going to tell... I think uh, none of these guys are placing buoys yet, so we'll tell him to drop a DIFAR buoy. Uh, you can right-click now, and then you'll see above and below the layer, okay? Uh, right now, with a helicopter, you, you don't know what the layer is. So to find that information out, we need to click on a ship. And then we can just go over where the keel information is, the depth under keel. And just hover over it, and it says thermal layer depth is zero feet. So that means there's no layer. And that's uh, true in real life, you know, there's not always going to be a layer. It depends on the weather and what's going on with the water. So um, we don't really have to worry about that. And, oh, I should have marked where that thing was when he's faded. I was not paying attention to that. But uh, he was going roughly eastbound, and uh, we're not too far off from that. So we're going to redetect him. And this is the actually the whole purpose of these helicopters is you find something on the long-range sensor, like a tow array, and then you vector the helicopter to reacquire it. And then once they reacquire it and, and they're positive of what they're looking at, then they'll go ahead and drop a torpedo on it. Uh, so with the buoy pl placement, as I was saying, um, I want to drop one in front of the contact. And I'll show you that once we regain contact, why that's important, okay? Uh, if you can imagine the dropping behind him, for instance, we've already put ourselves at a disadvantage because the contact is just getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker as every second ticks by. If we drop it in front of him, we get the benefit of the contact growing and growing and growing in signal strength and then passing us and then going back down. So we've got all that time on him. Okay, this is great. We've picked him up at uh, 1.8 nautical miles away. Uh, we'll wait to see what's going on with him. It, it's kind of strange. It looks like he's a uh, reverse course there, so we're going to take a look. So this yellow circle you see here, this oval, this is the um, oval of uncertainty. So right now we don't really know exactly where he's at, but he's somewhere in this oval, okay? As we maintain contact with him, that solution is going to get better and better and better. And then uh, we'll be able to really know exactly where he's at. For these torpedoes, if, uh, I mean, within this realm of uh, uncertainty, it's certainly enough for you to fire at it. But we're going to try and play it kind of realistically where we want to understand what he is first before we fire at him. Okay, so we'll drop another die far. And then with the... Um, SH-3, we're going to try and pass over him, and we'll see if we can get a mad hit. Okay, so remember, we all we need to do is uh, get this guy kind of almost right over the, the submarine, and then we should get a hit. Now, it is dependent on your um, contact size and the materials that it's made of, because some subs have other special things going on to deter the detection by mad equipment. All right, let's speed this up. Let's get him over. Okay, so you see there, it looks like we didn't get a hit. Try to swing back the other way here. Uh, if you're going against like something like an Oscar, you can detect that with your P3's mad equipment at like a couple hundred feet, so that's really cool. Uh, this guy must be a small, small submarine. Yep, not really getting anything. Okay, so let's... Uh, use our dipper. All you gotta do is uh, select your dipping sonar and then we'll say deploy. Let's get him to come to a stop first I guess. There it goes. Alright. So we are deploying our sonar and then we're gonna tell it to go active. And there we get an active return and it's small so that would explain why we're not picking up any um, uh, getting any mad hits off this guy. Now he's kind of trapped, he's uh, surrounded by a couple buoys, and uh, he's being pinged on by active. 
we want to find out what he is so we can right click on him go to information and it's telling you the sensors that are picking him up so one of the die far buoys is picking him up and then the other is the sh3 is active uh, we don't really know what he is yet you can see this confidence thing uh, getting better and better so as, as time elapses and you maintain the contact uh, you're gonna get better return it looks like he might be oh there we go okay so now he's a tango pretty small submarine now this is enough for us to shoot at him now when you're setting up your attack all we really want to aim for is come in from the uh, stern uh, try to um, manipulate our torpedo shot to go along in his baffles he's gonna have a harder time detecting that he's been shot at if that is the case then he's not gonna do his evasive maneuvers and launch all those noisemakers that tend to drive people crazy uh, and that saves us on the torpedoes because we don't have to waste a lot now in the future I'm hoping that those torpedoes become uh, something that's tracked in the ammo state because with the dynamic campaign if you have multiple scenarios uh, crossing parts of the Atlantic and you're constantly getting into ASW scenarios you're gonna want to preserve the amount of torpedoes you have um, and and also your sauna buoys as well so hopefully that also gets added to the ammo count but because of that we're gonna we're gonna train ourselves to be really careful with our shots and um, we have all the time in the world he's not really reacting if I was him though I, I would be I would be shocked if um, I was get if I was hearing all this active sonar really close to me we'll see how the shot goes now if we're talking about um, say in this scenario we dropped a couple torpedoes and we didn't have the SH-3 so it's just easy rider one out here save they dropped two torpedoes they're empty now launch your other helicopter from your ship and then wait till that comes on station to relieve them and then let them go and that seems obvious but I think some people if they haven't played late naval games and thought about this you might be um, thinking, oh, I can just launch all my helicopters at once and really try to find the submarine and kill them rapidly. Well, the problem with doing that is if you if you don't have it like the SH-3 and you only have SH-2s, they have the same fuel burn rate. So if you launch two SH-2s, they're all going to want to come back at the same time. And what tends to happen then is if you had contact, now everybody has to go home, get more fuel and weapons, and then come back. And by then, the Tango or whatever submarine it is might have time to just slink away and get away from your sauna buoys and then you lose detection that way and put yourself at risk so use one at a time if you can help it you, there's not a lot of reasons why you need all the helicopters out all at once okay looks like we got a good hit he does he wasn't really maneuvering away from that so it seems like he didn't know what was going on and I think that's it I don't want to make this too long it's going already 18 minutes I think so if you have any questions or comments, let me know, and I'll try to get to them as soon as possible. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.